And so I thought, okay, well, let's just do StarCraft Remastered. Um, I might get more viewers if I did StarCraft 2, but I, I really want to try to get to S rank before um, you know Stormgate or Zero Space, one of these other games comes out. Yeah. So, I mean, that's why. That's why I'm doing it right now. Okay. So, yeah. Fair enough. That mm -hmm. makes sense. I think um, I think that's contrary to what a lot of people in the community that never talked to you oh, about. Oh, yeah. They're, they're all mind readers down there. Look, StarCraft 2, right when it came out especially, was one of the funnest games. Hey, SE Historian here. Today is another one of those surreal uploads for me. When you spend your youth watching someone and idolizing them as an entertainer, as a community figure, but more importantly as an amazing person who bucked the societal norms to pursue their passions in life and made it work, you never think you'll have the chance to work with them as a professional. I did just that though when I sat down with Nick in order to discuss a huge number of topics ranging from his start with StarCraft to the shoddy business decisions we so often see in the esports industry and much more. If you're excited for this one, be sure to drop a like and a comment down below. And if you don't want to miss out on future pieces like this one, be sure to get subscribed. If you really love what I'm doing here, consider supporting me on Patreon. The link is in the video description. You don't need me to tell you that Nick is a fantastic orator, so let's all enjoy that by jumping in to my word with Tasteless. Okay, so uh, Tasteless, uh, thanks so much for, for taking the time today, man. Thank you for inviting me on, man. Of I course. appreciate it. Yeah, no, I appreciate your time. So just uh, jumping into things, how'd you, how'd you first get into StarCraft? Um, well, I got into RTS a little bit before StarCraft. I first saw RTS uh, at my friend's older brothers um I, I was at their house and i watched him play warcraft 2 on their pc so my friend's older brother and i was totally blown away i was watching um these naval ships that you could fill up with uh grunts and ogres and peons uh land on shore and kill a bunch of humans and then i saw the peons come out and they were cutting the wood uh, on the island and um i was watching him build a base there and i was like well this is crazy this is just not like anything uh, I had ever seen. I had played all these um, like platformer games or, or um, I don't know, first-person shooter games where you're one individual and you're trying to take on as many foes as possible. And then I had seen all these city builder games where you would construct a civilization, but I had never seen the action of like an RTS where you have many, you're, you're not one unit, you're kind of the whole thing and you're still building an economy and upgrading your tech and um, and scouting on the map. And so I became addicted. I played Warcraft 2 a bunch. Um, I mean, pretty much nonstop, messed around with the map editor. And then StarCraft 2, uh, sorry, StarCraft 1 came out. Um, and I mean, I was hooked. We got internet in my house, I think a year later. And so I had always liked uh, playing StarCraft 1 and, and, and Brood War uh, against PCs. But I had never played against uh, any people. I played, I guess, once at a PC cafe with my brother. We got our asses kicked. Uh, it was pretty humiliating. Um, but then when I got to the online play, that's when I was really sucked in. And that's when I kept playing. Um, I got into a channel called Clan X17, which was a team I eventually joined. Um, started reading about tournaments. There was a site called BattleReports.com, which is where they would record uh, the major matches with pictures and write text underneath them. Uh, I think you could still find it on like the Wayback Machine. Is that what it's called? Yeah. That, yeah. Okay. Um, so I, I became totally enthralled uh, in that. Eventually heard that there were Koreans that were competing on TV, which was like, that was like an impossible thing to find yeah. on the internet. And so eventually after enough work, I had found a Korean site I didn't know how to put Hangul, which is the Korean alphabet, on my computer. So I was clicking randomly on this a garbled text on this website. And eventually, I started to find the VODs. So I would watch uh, these different VODs. And at the time, because I heard the Koreans were the best, if you played online, you'd play against a lot of Koreans who'd always kill you. I thought I would figure out the exact perfect builds and have the game solved. And I was shocked when... I watched a ZVZ where in game one, the guy that won the game opened up pool first. But in game two, the player who also won game two, same player, opened up hatchery first. And I kind of went, oh my God. All right. So it's not solved. There's a lot here. So I've been obsessed ever since. 
Yeah, no, I think you raised a lot of interesting points. One thing you said that like really reminded me of something Tim Morton said was like <clears throat> during my interview that uh, like you don't have one individual representation of you as the player on screen, you know? Um, and that's really different. Like that, 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 that is like fairly unique to this genre. Like most other genres are, are, are really, uh, you know, like a first person shooter or a MOBA or whatever. You have one representation. So it's, it's yeah, it's kind of an abstract concept. Uh, and I think that's like, almost like a barrier to entry for some people, right? Because it's like a really unfamiliar thing when, when engaging with the game. So I just think that's kind of like an interesting point. So early on, once you started to become acquainted with the, you know, community at large and more specifically the Korean community, were there any specific players that you really idolized? So there were a couple of players I definitely idolized. I think you have the the standard ones, uh, Jadong, Flash, Bisu, because around... 2006-ish, uh, maybe 2005-ish, Team Liquid had become extremely good at covering the uh, the Korean StarCraft matches. Um, and there were systems in place to, to basically get the, the VODs. They had systems in place to hide spoilers as well. And so uh, I was watching a lot uh, back then with my brother. We shared an attic uh, in our mom's house. And so we would be up all night uh, watching StarCraft and playing StarCraft. And uh, I guess one of the big ones for me was a player called Nal Ra, who was huge back then. I think he's not as well known now. He's a commentator for League of Legends, I think, now. But uh, he also happened to be one of the first pro gamers I ever hung out with. So I got to drink with him at my hotel room at BlizzCon uh, and, and talk. And then he, he hung out with me when I first uh, moved out here. Um, I liked him because he was really solid, but he also had great cheese. He would do these crazy cheeses you can only do once, which was really fun to see. Yeah. Um, yeah. So d definitely him. Yeah. I think players like that have always been like kind of easy to love, you know, like the SOSs and parties yeah. of the world and stuff like that, that just like have the macro to back it up, but will also just pull out something that's complete nonsense. Yeah. Something that's like totally stylistic and can't be recreated again. And it's like, all right, well, you know, yeah. you really understand this game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like, uh, like imparting, uh, or yeah, it was blocked, blocked the at bottom of the ramp with the, right. with the yeah, yeah, pylons, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Like, like you can never recreate. Um, so, you know, when comparing, uh, you know, StarCraft 1 and StarCraft 2 in Korea, uh, I think, you know, a, a lot of people had different expectations as to how things uh, might play out and the overall, you know, long, long term reception of StarCraft 2 obviously didn't have the same type of cultural impact as Brood War. Why do you think that is? So this is going to be a long answer for that one. Um, in order to understand where StarCraft II uh, ended up in Korea globally, and here you have to understand what happened with StarCraft One, and then what happened in the design of StarCraft One itself. So when StarCraft One was made, there was no such thing as esports. Um, they had multiplayer because that was a great thing to have in any game, right? This was one of the big deals back then was you could connect on LAN and play uh, with a friend and, and have these crazy experiences. So there was games like Quake uh, that were doing this in LAN cafes, um, Counter-Strike 1.3, so even before 1.6. Uh, that was a thing at, at uh, LAN cafes and then StarCraft 1. And so when StarCraft came out, Obviously, it, it got a lot of attention, right? It was it was a big, people loved the multiplayer. But at the same time in Korea, there was a Japanese uh, cultural import ban. So the Japanese products like Nintendo, PlayStation, you couldn't get them here. Or they were hard to get, they were expensive. Uh, and so kids growing up in Korea didn't have access to that. What they did have access to was American PC games. Um, so... StarCraft 1 and uh, Rainbow Six, surprisingly, uh, were huge at, at PC cafes. And the thing about Korea at the time was the government, and I guess it's true to this day, they subsidized the internet. So the internet's very cheap. Everybody has access to it. And there are PC cafes everywhere. There were not really many arcades. Hmm. Even in Seoul now, there's, you know, maybe I could think of like a dozen or 20 arcades, you know. And half of them are bars, you know, they just have arcade games in there. So you had um, <clears throat> a country where it's 85% urban. So most Koreans have an urban experience. In other words, they live in an apartment building. Um, they have a convenience store on their street. They've got restaurants right outside their door. They have a PC cafe there as well. 
So everybody was going to PC cafes. And so everybody was playing StarCraft. Eventually, there were, you know, rival PC cafes and, and tournaments started to form. And there was one television channel called On Game Net, which was dedicated to gaming content, kind of like G4 in the US, only I would say basically better. So they started putting the StarCraft tournaments on TV. This turned out to be a huge success. This became a cultural phenomenon where everybody was watching it, everybody was talking about it, and um, it, it took off. Now keep in mind that Blizzard never even translated the game into Korean. Korea was not on the radar as a place you even sell games. Maybe Japan. Um, although, you know, PC gaming in Japan back then wasn't that big either. It was all these analog consoles. <laughs> so, you know, Blizzard was caught off guard for sure. They were also not aware the game could be played at this level, right? Or, or this fast. Um, now, <clears throat> these tournaments start to blow up. They have all these major Korean companies get involved in sponsorships. So LG, Samsung... Um, if you go look at all the old pro teams, um, SK Telecom, a lot of these companies are what are called chable companies. So they were companies that back when Korea economically was in very bad shape, the government backed heavily a couple of these companies and helped them monopolize to help build the economy. And that's why the Korean economy is a phenomenon. This used to be one of the poorest countries in Asia. Now it's one of the richest. Um, and so these chable companies that are historically just powerhouses in the country, they started pouring their money into the advertising. And then Blizzard said, okay, wait a minute, no one's talking to us. They've taken our game. Now everybody's making money off of it um, through advertising. Uh, people are buying tickets, filling up stadiums. And that's IP theft, right? That's intellectual property theft. Um, and so Blizzard tried to legally intervene. They didn't have, you know, they didn't have offices here, I think, especially at the time when this happened. Uh, although they did move offices in here pretty quickly. So the Korean StarCraft uh, one people, when they got a cease and desist from Blizzard, it just cut off communication. Um, went to the government for protection, created a government body called KESPA, um, and basically iced Blizzard out. Um, now, I think there were mistakes made by Blizzard here. I think that they also could have just put the game on TV in America and probably, you know, it would have done well there too. Um, but Blizzard never had the intention of, of killing it. That would not make any sense. And you can see Blizzard completely obsessed with these sports, StarCraft 2 and on. Um, <clears throat> the Korean uh, teams uh, and, and, and the Chable companies that were backing them and making money off of this their legal argument was that Blizzard invented the ball and they invented soccer. So Kespa uh, and, <clears throat> excuse me, all these uh, <clears throat> map makers and tournament organizers, they, they made the rules for the tournament, they uh, designed the maps, uh, and they figured out how to play the game. And this is never uh, Blizzard's, like, Blizzard has nothing to do with this. They made the ball. Um, but Blizzard would say, okay, but everything you're doing is inside the game. You can't do it without our game. Uh, so I didn't know about this until I moved out here. I sort of vaguely knew about this, but I didn't get it until I'm here. And I realized there are no Blizzard people present at these tournaments. Nobody's talked to anybody, uh, at Blizzard and they won't. And they, and they both view each other kind of as pirating, you know, the, the other person's stuff. Uh, <clears throat> so then you get to StarCraft too, right? So Blizzard's response to all that was, we're going to make another game, and also this game's going to be online, because we don't ever want somebody taking our <laughs> intellectual property and running it without us controlling it. Yeah. This is why when you see people saying, Blizzard, we need land, it's yeah. like, are you fucking crazy? Yeah. And that, it's also, they can, they can get a lot of important data for balance and stuff like that by analyzing ladder games, but yeah, they're not going to have the game, that let, let somebody run away and steal millions of dollars. Yeah. Uh, of something that they made. So StarCraft 2 comes out, and then Caspa won't let the pro gamers play StarCraft 2. So in a lot of ways, StarCraft 1 was... Or Star, sorry, StarCraft 2 was hobbled from the very start. You couldn't get Jadong or Flash or Visu 
to go, even though some of them wanted to, to go play in these tournaments. So when we started GSL, which is, you know, the first big StarCraft II league, um, all the people that were playing were ex-pros, or they were just people not on teams. Yeah. Um, some players left teams because they th saw this as an opportunity, right? That's how you have like Nesty and MVP. And these these were guys that played um, on TV and they thought, now I think there's an opportunity here and left. Um, but they couldn't get, Blizzard couldn't get the Korean cable companies to capitulate and put StarCraft II on Korean cable, which cable mattered back then. Um, they also couldn't get the players, right? And so this really hurt StarCraft II uh, in Korea at the start. Um, now, globally, StarCraft II did extremely well because it did not have anything that inhibited it. Um, and that included outside Korea, like MLG, or what the events ESL and DreamHack have produced. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, GSL um, uh, and, and other tournaments that we've done here in Korea. But that's the, the history of that, and that's also why it was really messy at the start. And eventually Blizzard, uh, like all the uh, uh, IP holders, they won this fight long-term in esports. So Riot controls everything out here. Kespa is, it's like a, it's like a government office now. It, it doesn't, it's not this, you know, hegemonic force it was before. And um, even at the end, uh, well, not at the end, I should say like a couple of years in, eventually on GameNet and these other TV networks started panicking saying, okay, we want to do StarCraft 2 as well. Yeah. Um, but when they did the switch over, it was very late. Uh, a lot of the, the fans, you know, didn't perceive it as, as good of a game as it was. Um, and a lot of the StarCraft 1 pros that switched over um, immediately started streaming on Afrika TV and found they just got more viewers playing StarCraft 1 mm -hmm. and StarCraft 2 in Korea. So uh, I hope that makes sense. There's a, a lot there. But <laughs> no, yeah. And that totally makes sense. Like, I, I think, you know, one thing that really, by my view anyway, propelled StarCraft 1 as well was this element of <clears throat> star power. Um, and right. like like the recognition of these individual gamers that you know sort of uh, rose above a lot of the others, um, and yeah, like StarCraft Two was kneecapped in that sense, right? Where where all of the, the 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 big personalities and faces just weren't able to compete. So I think that's a big part of it. But yeah, I, I think it's also just uh, they're very different games too, obviously. And yeah. I think you know people being super used to uh, you know StarCraft One. It flows so differently, and 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 things, uh, the strategic decisions are, are very different in how they play out. But we, you know, we'll, we'll kind of get to that. Sure. But, but yeah, I think your I think your answer totally. Uh, I, I think I think a lot it. of it is marketing. You know, uh, there was a lot of Koreans that thought you couldn't play it at the PC Bong for free, which was just I don't know if that was a rumor perpetuated by the other side. That's something I thought until I got to meet with Mike Morheim uh, one of the first times in Korea, and he was asking me why it's not doing well, and I'm like, you can't play a PC caps. He's like, you can. And I'm like, oh, I'm like, this is embarrassing. <laughs> um, but you know, it's uh, yeah. I, you know, I think I think the game has still done extraordinarily well, and Koreans do still play it. If you go to a PC cafe and look around, you'll see at least one person on StarCraft Two. You'll see a couple on StarCraft One. StarCraft One still top five in PC cafes. But I think StarCraft One has a, a legacy and a, and a lore to it, and an allure that StarCraft Two doesn't quite have out here. Yeah, and I think of course the other big thing is. Um, competition, right? Like StarCraft 1 didn't have that much competition. StarCraft 2 had a lot of competition, you know, within the first few years in terms of MOBAs and, and, and you know, shooters becoming really big and things of that nature as well. Um, but, so, <clears throat> moving on from that, like, at what point in your life did you realize that, like, StarCraft was going to be as significant of a force as, as it has been? For me or, or, or yeah, in general? You. Yeah. So, I just knew that I liked StarCraft. I did not really think that it would necessarily be a way I could make a living. In fact, at some point in time in college, I kind of had accepted uh, that, probably my freshman or sophomore year. I had a lot of dreams of being a professional gamer and going to Korea. And although I did qualify, almost every time I tried to compete, I would qualify for top 16 to top 12. Every year, sometimes it's national. Sometimes it was top 12, which is a weird number, too, to have. But um, I would get into that, right? I would be able to win regionals in the U.S. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, there was just no money. 
right? I mean, you, I was losing money playing StarCraft. I loved what I was doing. I kind of viewed it like, um, you know, basketball or boxing or something like that. Um, it was not until I got to start uh, doing casting that I realized, okay, there's really something here. I also applied for a job at Blizzard and got to the final interview when I was like, I think 20 uh, for an RTS game, which now I know is StarCraft 2. I had to take uh, a whole bunch of essay tests and, and like uh, problem puzzle tests. Uh, what kind I, of role I, was it? It would have been in balance. Oh, yeah, huh. yeah. fascinating. Or, or some some form of balance or design. I can't remember. Sure. Uh, and I got all the way to the Dustin Browder interview, and I just I fucking bombed. Oh no! I got nervous, and I, I don't know. I was like, I'm I'm like. I'm like cringing just thinking about it, but like I just, I just wasn't good. I thought I had to kind of brown nose, or I like looked up the other games he worked on and thought, okay, I'm going to say good things about that. I mean, I could have just spoken my mind, but um, yeah. So I, I did some casting work. Uh, I, I, I kind of impromptu got casting work in New York. Um, I think in 2005. There's a documentary on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, that you can see where uh, you actually see me go pitch the idea to do it. So I started getting casting work there. I did do one gig in Korea um, where I actually got offered to be on a pro team. Like I, the guy said, you know, I know several pro teams who wanted to do it. But then when he showed me photos uh, of like the pro houses, I'm like, oh, no, like I'm not going to do this. Like I was, uh, I think, a junior or a senior in college. And I, I, I was already at the point where I'm like, I don't want a roommate. I, I want my own space. Yeah. And so... You know, seeing eight guys in, in a room with bunk beds, yeah. I was like, okay, I'm, I'm not going to do that. So um, when I, I knew that it was going to be a big thing in my life was when I got a job offer to come to Korea. So I knew when I had the, the casting gigs, I'm like, okay, something's here. I'm getting them to pay me. And I'm also seeing all these other people working at these events. Clearly, you know, this can't all be volunteer, right? Um, and even if I was just getting paid like hundreds of dollars. For a college kid, that's still a lot of money back then. And um, I thought, okay, well, there's something here. And this seems to be like a, maybe twice a year I'll get invited to a foreign country. They're paying for my flight. They pay for my hotel. Um, you know, uh, and they give me a little bit of money. Maybe this can be something. But I got a job offer to move to Korea uh, to work for a TV station called Arirang TV, where they were re-recording old professional gamer matches for uh, StarCraft, but primarily Warcraft 3. Um, and so I, I came here and did that. So, obviously that was the beginning of your professional career in StarCraft was, you know, coming out here to Korea. Um, what's been, the, like, the best part about living in Korea for you? You've been here for quite some time now, you know? What, what have you really enjoyed? Oh, I mean... I love living in Korea. I didn't know a lot about Korea until I had, you know, visited once for, for work. I, I, I was here for like, I guess, eight days. Actually, I'm sorry. I, I worked here two separate times, um, e each one for a week. Uh, I always thought big cities were cool. I, I was always, I don't know. I remember looking at a globe. My, <laughs> there was a globe at my grandfather's house when I was a kid. And I would like move the globe around and I'd be like, okay, so where am I? And I would find Kansas on, on the, the globe. And I go, okay, and be like, where's New York? And I go all the way across. Go, Damn, I'm really far away. Okay, where's LA? All right. Uh, and then when we go into downtown Kansas City, because I was in a suburb, I was like, whoa, this is like, everybody's here. There's things happening. So when I got to Seoul, uh, it was like that, but on a much more immense level. The food's great. The city's safe. Um, the public transportation is really good. Um, I'm a guy that likes to go out in the evenings, get drinks with friends. The nightlife is fantastic. I love Korean saunas. I like going to the spas here. I like PC cafes. I mean, there's, there's a lot here for someone like me. And you're next to a bunch of other great countries. You're next to Japan. You're next to China. Um, I mean, I've gone on trips to Mongolia and, you know, all over Southeast Asia. So it's, it's a good place to be. For sure. Have there been any really significant downsides that you feel like, uh, you know, like I wish X wasn't like this or something like that? Any downsides with Korea? Uh, I mean, for me, no. No, I don't, I don't mind. I don't mind really anything about being out here. I mean, I'm pretty comfortable. I'm trying to think of 
It'd be, I mean, in some of these restaurants, it'd be nice if there was like a chair you could sit down on when you take your shoes off and on instead of balancing on one foot. But <laughs> these are small gripes. Um, Definitely. I get to travel a lot for my work. And I'm usually, you know, back in the U.S. once or twice a year anyways. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, the truth is no. And I also enjoyed the challenge of trying to integrate here, you know, and, and even doing uh, simple tasks early on was kind of a rewarding thing. So, no, I don't have any real problems here. That makes sense. I mean, I, I think it's a great city. Like, I, I yeah. also really like this sort of urban environment. So, I, yeah, yeah, I definitely relate to that. Um, do you feel like you have a really firm grasp on the Korean language at this point? So, uh, I would say my Korean's pretty good. It could be better. Um, when you live out here long enough, uh, you'll meet some expatriates who are like, like really good. Like, um, I'm going to a housewarming party later this week at a friend's place. And he's a, a white guy from Florida who works at a law firm. He's like a Korean lawyer. So like my Korean compared to his, it's like, no, I mean, sure. I, I would, I would say it functions in everything that I do for my day to day. I don't have problems. Um, I would like to go take some more lessons again and brush up a little bit. I've been told <clears throat> some of the things I say grammatically are incorrect, but like it makes sense. Yeah. So, I mean, it'd be nice to brush up on that. But I think now in Korea, you would not have to know as much Korean. When I first moved out here, there was not that much English anywhere. People didn't speak English. I've been out here for about 15 years. So a lot of the kids that were in English lessons, they're grown ups now. And so they're speaking. So it's, I think it's not as necessary. But when I moved out here, I had to learn uh, Korean pretty quickly. Oh, I mean, I, yeah, I speak zero Korean pretty much. And I, I use Google Translate, but a lot of people speak English. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not that big of a deal, actually. Oh, yeah. I mean, I have a lot of experiences now where I'll like go to a restaurant and try to order food. In Korean, and they keep speaking English to me, and I keep speaking Korean to them. And I'm like, what, what are you doing here, man? Like, uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, look, the, the, the city's gotten a lot more cosmopolitan. So there's a lot more people coming here, and a lot more Koreans are coming back that lived abroad. So yeah, English is becoming a lot more prevalent. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Obviously, um, still a pretty homogenous country, but a lot less so than it was. Like, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, during the early days of GSL under GOM, it seems like there was kind of a focus and, and a pretty clear way to monetize what was a really big audience, the foreign audience for them, right? In, in terms of charging for this uh, high resolution stream. Now, obviously that's not like a typical business model these days, but it's weird to me because it feels like during, or since Africa, you know, has assumed ownership of the GSL, um, they never really, until this crowdfunding campaign recently, made of an active effort to monetize the foreign audience, which in the case of StarCraft oh, 2 is the biggest audience. I totally agree. Yeah, I don't, I mean, I have a lot of thoughts on that. No, I think, and I think there's also monetization in many of, of the areas of esports have, have not been done correctly. Was um, it, that's not a department I control and I don't have a lot of say in that. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, I think that uh, it's important to know how to monetize the thing. So I have this, uh, conversation a lot with people and uh, it's about esports and I think it's really important and I think that so many times when I start explaining this people's eyes glaze over where I say a lot of esports doesn't make money yeah. and when I say make money that I don't mean like we need to be you know billionaires in a, in a smoky room filled with cigars yeah. I mean the thing needs to pay for itself so you can do it again yeah uh, uh these events it's labor you have to have camera people you have to have audio technicians, you have to have referees, you have to have someone who takes care of the PCs. So, um, yeah, I mean, with, you know, GSL, I think there were many lost opportunities to monetize it, but it's also a show that was picked up by GOM. The idea was that, well, actually it wasn't picked up, it was made by GOM, but the idea was we're going to get people onto the GOM player, which now we know the VLC player won. But their idea was we're going to make unique content for this, um, and unfortunately it didn't work, but then we had, they had the show that was just laying around that people liked. And so Afrika TV picked it up, which was a streaming platform. Um, and so we've been with Afrika TV for some time now. Yeah, like eight, nine years, something, something like, like that. Something like that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it, it's just like, I think my theory, and I think maybe it is just kind of the answer, is that, you know, GSL is really the odd duckling in the Africa TV portfolio in the sense that they're a Korean domestic company. Everything they do is is oriented around the Korean domestic market. 
Well, well, also, I think that their hope was that people would go onto the Africa TV website to watch it. Um, but that has not been successful. Yeah. So, um, look, I mean, there's a lot of things with GSL. And I love that show. That's like one of the big things I've done with my life. Yeah. Um, if we could go back in time and do things differently, I think it, it could have been done much better. I mean, it's still a legacy show that really captures the history of, of StarCraft II. We've had a lot of the best players in the whole world venture to Korea, stay here and train just to, to compete in it. Um, but there's a lot of lessons to be learned from that as well, I think. I've also, in my own career, experienced a lot of moments where I realize I'm, I'm kind of beholden to forces that are out of my hands. Yeah. When I had, do you know the Avertech Intel Classic, the StarCraft mm -hmm. One tournament I did? So that was killed by Kespa because they pulled the players out, right? And then it was like, okay, well, GSL might die like later on because the VL, uh, a VLC is going to kill the Golem player. And then it's like, all right, well, if we don't get bought by a freaking TV, we don't know if the show's going to go on. Yeah. Uh, now Blizzard's falling apart. Blizzard clawed back the entire esports ecosystem. And all those people are gone. Yeah. And so this is, uh, as a caster, I have been beholden to a lot of forces that are kind of out of my hands. Yeah. It's why, I don't know if you've seen Tasis Land Party. Yeah, of course. So that's that's just me producing that with a team that I have. Because yeah. I'm like, okay, well, I, I know how to do this. I know, I know how to cast. I definitely know all the rules of these tournaments. I know what the players need. Um, and I just, I, so I've been working with Corey Gaming and making stuff like that. In part because I just want to make things without having to, you know, be stuck with forces that are so big and so out of my hands that yeah. I, you know, I get swept away. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it's it, it sounds um, a little unnerving, yeah, to be sort of... There's been so many times where my life is great, and then it's like, wait, what's happening? You know, Kess was going to pull out the players? This is my entire income, you know, yeah, yeah. I'm fucked. So, yeah, I mean, that's just, uh, I, mean, it's, it, it, I, I mean, that's not just me. That's every caster. A lot of pro players are like, shit, I just want to play this game. Um, am I going to be able to do that? Am I going to be able to make a living Yeah. Uh, if things get crazy? I mean, it was very scary for everybody when um, they started just killing off the entire uh, esports department at Blizzard. Yeah. From Hearthstone to Heroes of the Storm to StarCraft. You know, I was like, oh. I used to know like literally over 100 people at Blizzard. Yeah. And we, we'd work in tandem together to, to make these events. So, yeah. I've heard that pretty much across the board. Yeah. yeah that, like <clears throat> most people that are in StarCraft these days know nobody at Blizzard now or like three or four like random. Yeah. 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 That sort of thing. I know one guy and he works on Diablo Immortal, you know, and it's like, I mean, he's a great guy, yeah. but it's, you know, it's if I have a problem, I, yeah. what am I, you know, am I going to yeah. go to him? So, you know. No, no, that, that absolutely makes sense. It's, yeah, it's. Yeah, StarCraft's kind of been kicked. StarCraft Two has been kind of kicked around in, yeah, in like some yeah, sure. some weird ways. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, coming into this year, obviously we saw this this crowdfunding campaign take off and and uh, you know really revitalize uh, GSL that looked like it was sort of in its death throes. Um, were you expecting that that, that that kind of response from the foreign community? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, I think they got the idea from my Patreon for ASL I made with Dan. Mm -hmm. Um, no, of course. I mean, the scene's been very supportive, uh, and you know, it's, it's great. I'm happy for it. it. All that money, but, but I think Patreon takes like an 8% cut or yeah. something like that. All that money goes to the prize pool, which is great because, you know, the Africa TV, they own the studio yeah. and half the people that, that are there are staff. So they're able to kind of run it on a skeleton crew, um, and still put out, you know, the, the content. So that's great. Um, I do think we're moving into an area that, if you're from the StarCraft II era, you, some people might not be as comfortable with it as others in that we're in the kind of crowdfunding era yeah. of this. So when I started out in StarCraft II, there were a lot of people that were completely irate that GOM TV would charge for high quality, by the way. Which, I, it's like, okay, I get it, but this, it can't be free. Yeah. Like, would you would you still be saying that if it was not here anymore, yeah. if it's gone? Um and, you know, there's a couple ways to monetize things, but, you know, this is the same generation and era where they're like, we don't want ads anywhere. No ads. I'm like, okay, <laughs> you know, again, wh where are these studios going to come from? Where, where is the camera guy going to come from? Who, how are you going to pay the casters? Yeah. Yeah, how are, you know, the players, they need a prize pool. Um, I think some people look at especially esports events and they see like $150,000 prize pool. So they think, okay, $150,000, like, 
No, dude. Yeah, that, like that's millions of that's dollars. That's nothing. Like, yeah. That's nothing. Yeah. To, to, to put this on. Um, yeah, it's like dozens of people's livelihood, right? Is, is, is to produce these kind of events, right? Yeah, they, yeah. They, they have to make a living. They, yeah. have, they have to eventually upgrade in their careers. They should try to make a little bit more every year. Yeah. Um, I think that there's also a group of people that are like, you know, this is a game or the, the, I don't know, I'm doing my job that sucks. Why is you know, there's some negativity with that? Sure. Why is this, the, you know, the way it is? Um, I, even if you want to go back uh, to another situation, MLG was charging like 15 bucks, 20 bucks to get like 10 streams. There was like 10 streams going on in the tournament. And people were like mad about it. It's just like, I, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't know what to say. And at the time, the advertising money wasn't there yet. Advertising money is finally, I'd say, here within the last couple of years, and some of that's due to streaming. But I think esports as a niche wasn't. It was hard to explain to advertisers what it, like, what it is. Yeah. The word esport was actually coined by the. Koreans here because it's easy to go to a government body and say and get backing for a sporting event It's why it's called that oh, it's a, it's not a sport It's an electronic sport, but yeah. you don't call it a competitive gaming tournament because if you're gonna go to the government when the Korean government's been pretty anti-gaming for a lot of its history You're much more likely to get someone to sign off on something uh, if it's that That's fascinating. And I then when you go to that. these foreign sponsors you say esports they go it's not a sport you go Okay. okay. Whatever the fuck you want to call it, man. It, you know, we could say competitive gaming. We could say whatever. But yeah, so I think it was harder for some sponsors to get on board. Uh, and, and, you know, they hadn't seen the, the boom yet. The, the big issue with, um, uh, I, should, I say foreign sponsors, let's say American sponsors, is they're like, this needs to be on ESPN because that's where sports is. So there's this whole escapade Blizzard went on where they got Heroes of the Storm on ESPN. And uh, I helped uh, host the collegiate that. thing, right? You yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's like, I mean, it did okay, I guess, but, you know, cable's dying. Yeah. This is just sort of an old model. I think now with, you know, the growth of Netflix and Apple TV and, and Disney Plus and Twitch and all these online streaming platforms, I think sponsors get it a little bit better. So money's coming in that way. Hmm. I'm sorry if I'm rambling. I'm no, kind of no. all over the place. That's but fine. Yeah. 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 Um, <clears throat> okay, so swinging back to this sort of um, gameplay comparison between Brood Wars mm -hmm. and Warcraft 2. So... Obviously, you elected when you started, you know, streaming a lot more to play StarCraft 1. Uh, you know, obviously, it also, StarCraft 1 is the game you competed in competitively. Sure, yeah. Um, why do you think, like, StarCraft 1 seems to have scratched the itch for you a little bit more than StarCraft 2? I think because Remastered came out. I think, so first of all, I had a, a, a hand injury. It was a misdiagnosed broken bone in my hand. I had a year for, where, where there was a fracture here, like a hairline fracture. Um, and all the doctors, I went to like three different doctors that didn't see it. I ended up going to a wrist specialist who finally saw it. So there was a whole year I couldn't type or really use my hands. Oh. Um, and then when I finally, you know, they put a cast on it, it was like six weeks or something. And then I had to do some rehab. Um, I ended up getting an RSI injury because I had none of the muscles in my hands that I had growing up. And I tried to go back and play, you know, all, all these, you know, every game, not even just StarCraft. I was just like, all right, finally, I've got a controller. I've got a keyboard and mouse. Um, so then I got another injury that took a long time to recover from. So there was like a couple years I just wasn't able to play. I would watch streams and, um, you know, I, I never had the issue with my left hand as much. So I could play like a point and click adventure game with my left hand and stuff like that. Um, so and, and Remastered was out at that time. If you look at that StarCraft launch party, I'm actually in like a cast on my right hand. So everybody's playing StarCraft Remastered, having fun. I can't. <laughs> I can't play. So, um around when the pandemic hit was around when my wrists had recovered. And so I thought, okay, well, let's just do StarCraft Remastered. Um, I might get more viewers if I did StarCraft 2, but I, I really want to try to get to S rank before, um, you know, Stormgate or Zero Space, one of these other games comes out. Yeah. So, I mean, that's why. That's why I'm doing it right now. Okay. So, yeah. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. I think, um, I think that's contrary to what a lot of people in the community that, Never talked to you. Oh about yeah, they're they're all mind readers down there. Look, StarCraft Two, right when it came out, especially was one of the funnest games, yeah. one of the funnest experiences to be like, okay, like it's like StarCraft, but like I got I can maybe I can get a strategy that's going to give me the cutting edge. Yeah. Um, 
I mean, we actually went to a tournament, Dan, me, and Idra, uh, went to China to represent the USA. And there was like three Chinese players, three Americans, and three Koreans. And we beat the Korean team. They, they had invited over Warcraft 3 Koreans because it's China. They like Warcraft 3 more than uh, StarCraft. And then we lost to the Chinese team. Um, but yeah, I mean, I loved playing StarCraft too. I don't, I don't have anything against huh. it. But I don't know. I, I do think when you look at the internet, there's always the uncharitable take. Yeah. This is a, a really unfortunate insight. I mean, there's the fact that people will just say mean things when they're anonymous. But also, when you see people have serious takes, it's always the most uncharitable one yeah you know yeah yeah yeah. so yeah that makes sense yeah no i uh <clears throat> just in reference to that I, I i just for like one or two matches hopped on the home story cup cast because it's like hanging out there and yeah, yeah um i made the mistake of looking at the twitch <laughs> twitch chat oh uh, yeah yeah i know it's <laughs> in respect <laughs> regardless no that, that, that that's that's actually really interesting i yeah like i said i think uh there's been this like made up but prevailing opinion in the community that like obviously while you cared and liked about starcraft 2 like you sure. made a career out of it that it doesn't you didn't like the game that much yeah i think people did feel that way well, no, so they, but also there were times i did not like the game like heart of the swarm well yeah but nobody liked the game yeah you know and then try casting those swarm host matches yeah absolutely um sounds like a nightmare yeah i mean so i mean it, uh, you know on some level that as well i think it's true but i think anybody who played through that period of the game could also relate you know and i think with legacy of the void it got a lot more interesting yeah but there was definitely like a dark period for starcraft 2 where it's like like i remember when the swarm house came out i'm like what the fuck is this thing yeah for you what are we doing we're having like just automated yeah things attack into each other and then you know when you cast those days some of those games would be like you know 55 minutes yeah and you know you have potentially like you know nine more games after that yeah you know and um and that was that was also at a time when there was no, you know, these events were so not with it. You, they would have people casting for like 10, 12 hours in a day. Yeah. And I think someone might tune in and be like, oh, he's, he doesn't like this. It's like, well, I don't like the, you know, the 12 hour day is straight. Yeah. Or the, uh, the fact that the game's in a state that I think is fundamentally less interesting and not a StarCraft as, as before. but. Yeah. But um, the vast majority of, of casting StarCraft II has been good. Yeah. You know, it's been fun. The, the, the games we just had were great. Absolutely. I had a blast casting them at GSL yesterday. Yeah, no, I mean, StarCraft II, I think, has been in a really good place for a really long time. Yeah, yeah. I think it's very funny to, like, look at some of the balance complaints in today's day and age because they seem, like, so small and insignificant yeah, yeah. compared to some of the, like, like the Brood War Infestor days or, like, the Swarm Horse era mm -hmm. where, like, the game was fundamentally broken. Yeah. Um, like, sure, maybe Zerg is a little favorite. Maybe Creek's a strong mechanic or something like that. Like, yeah. But those things can't be fixed, right? Like, at this point. Well, yeah, I think some of it is just the way the game is, yeah. for sure. Um, but, okay. So, you know, when when we talk about, like, uh, you know, Brood War, obviously a very different game in Star Trek 2. What elements of Brood War, like, do you hope to see in, like, Stormgate or, or other future RTS titles? Well, <clears throat> you know, Brood War is always a tricky one to break down. I've always found that when I talk about RTS games, everybody's seen a different thing. A lot of times people are not on the same page. Um, I think what they didn't... I shouldn't say what they did, because they didn't actually mean to do it. It kind of came this way. Uh, everything is, is super busted and strong in Brood War, which I like. I feel like there's a lot of kind of watering things down in RTS games where I think it's probably better to just kind of amp everything up and make it a little bit crazier. Um, Brood War is a clunky game, but because like I have to make each of my probes at the Nexus separately, I'm having to do more things. The bigger I get, the more bases I get. Uh, and what's happened with StarCraft 2 is, I think unintentionally, they just sped the game up. So StarCraft 2 things are decided in like half a second sometimes. Yeah. Like sometimes you just see like a force field where it's like, okay, the force field's like that. And then, you know, the bailings get through yeah. and, and, um. Well, especially the early days, like the Wings of Liberty tournaments sure. are hilarious to look back on. It's like, sure. is he going to land the force field? He didn't. I guess he died. Yeah. Brood War is a little bit slower. If you go on Korean forums, they'll talk about how they like that there's a slower pace to it. Um, obviously, the units don't move perfectly, but it, it's slow enough that you can kind of... Someone can be losing a fight and someone can control a little bit better Yeah, and, and, and take the fight, um, you know, even if they're down a little bit. 
but I think the thing that makes Brood War so good is there's this, it kind of, it's an ugly macro mechanic because it's so basic in that you can't select that many, build, you only select one building, you can't select more than 12 units. But that feature is what actually, uh, I think, he can, can keep the game interesting, can keep it balanced. You don't have these games where everybody can do everything. You don't have that in StarCraft 2 either. People, I think, think that you can, especially people from Brood War, where they look at it, you know, the, the macro system, but it's just decided on, on a more uh, thin line. So I, um, I hope they keep a complex macro mechanic. To be honest with you, Age of Empires 4... Uh, I never played H2, so I can't speak to that, but I did play a little bit of H4. That's a good macro mechanic. I'm making like 100 workers. They're all doing different things. Uh, each one, there's all these different ideas you have to toy with. Um, I think that's good. So I think complicated macro mechanics are good. Yeah. And um, if, if you watch my casting, I've said many times StarCraft 2 is the fastest RTS game. I don't think we need a faster RTS game than that, yeah. or we need one as fast. I don't know. I think they kind of did it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think that the, yeah. the, it hurts the barrier to entry a lot. I think that, like... Yeah, the, well, this, this is the mistake people make, is they think that StarCraft Two is easier. Yeah. And, yeah, I've, I've taught people both games. Like, I've got a lot of friends that I make, you know, out here, and so they go, can you, can you show me? Can I come to your apartment? I go, yeah. You sit. StarCraft Two things are going real fast. Yeah. And the, the additional workers they gave at the start, that was cool. Yeah. I liked it. I sang a lot of praise for that right when, uh... It came out because I'm like, well, all the builds are different. It never even occurred to me. You could just keep changing the, the worker number. But um, it's really hard for a new player to get three bases up, which you have to do in yeah. a lot of these openings. Like, really, if the third base isn't up in yeah, time, five minutes, you're yeah. fucked. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, there's I could talk about this for hours. For sure. But, uh, you know, for these newer games, I also need to play them and see what they're, what they're working with and, and what I like and don't like. So, yeah. Yeah. So... <clears throat> yeah, moving on to like some of the, those other like newer titles, like you mentioned Stormgate, Zero Space, and then there's like the Tempest Rising, um, which seems a bit different but interesting. Um, do you see yourself being like heavily involved in Stormgate or, or any of the other titles? Yeah, I would like to. Um, we are at a point where, you know, they're both in alpha, and I'm also pretty NDA'd, I can't say. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've, I've consulted... Uh, a lot with Stormgate, as a lot of the, the Korean pros have. I'm really glad that they're they're reaching out and talking to us. Um, and I have talked to Zero Space a little bit. I think we just need to wait until we're further along. But yes, I would like to do that. Yeah, yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. I mean, obviously, it seems like kind of the clear path forward for mm -hmm. the community. Um, so I think you know, obviously, there's a lot of excitement there. Um, what do you think? new RTS titles can or should do that would help onboard people that are not RTS fans right now? So I think one thing they could do to help onboard new RTS fans in games is make training mechanisms in the games. Why is everybody always having to make their own use map setting thing? Teach me how to micro units. Teach me, give me a simulation where I macro uh, off of four bases or you know, whatever, whatever the game is. Um, if it's like a game with heroes, teach me how to creep. Teach me how to do creep routes. You need the big problem with a lot of these game designers is it's that RTS is too hard. Well, it's hard because you're not teaching people. People like me or Artosis or my brother had to go in and figure this out. Okay. But then training tools came out, right? And like once you start to use some of these things, if you use like a micro map where you have to like, you know, have fights with two different little yeah. things. You can figure that out. You know, you can learn that on your own. Um, I mean, if you look back at like Korean Pro StarCraft and like some of the things people were tinkering with and what they were able to map out in a, in a game that was that unknown, it's crazy. But um, why not have all these tools just right when you start out? Oh, yeah. you don't want to you don't want to play a game? Wait, wait, give me a warm up thing. Yeah. Kind of like Aim Lab. Have you seen Aim Lab yeah, yeah. in these shooting games? Yeah. G give me an Aim Lab or in Valorant they have like that little. Uh, Shooting range. Oh, that I don't know. But. So they have like a little shooting range you can do. You can practice stuff. Think of that on a bigger level. I think you could build that out for a lot of RTS games. Because I think you should em embrace the complexity. I don't... Because if you don't embrace complexity and don't make it hard, then the hardcore people aren't there. Yeah. And that's going to be your big advertising tool as well. Yeah, I think Dota did it really well, especially with yeah. like, yeah, some of those, like, like because the items is so many different builds and, and, and strategies, but it's really nice that you can just be like... 
show me the basic one and, and you can just move through the motions and it right. gives you these pointers. Um, I think it's a dangerous game with RTS sometimes where it's like, I think it is weird theoretically to have like a build order that like that you play out. Like I, I think that's a cool idea, but I, I also am afraid of like all like only cheese and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Kind of messing sure. up the ladder. Well, you like, know, it's it's kind of like a chess opening, right? Yeah. You could show somebody the form of checkmate, and but imagine chess where there's like you know micro or something yeah. involved. Um, but you know, just the idea of showing somebody, okay, there's a pattern that you're following. Yeah. If you're really good, you can have like. It's almost like the base of a tree and it branches out in all these insane directions. But you can kind of show somebody, all right, just try to get your second base up. Yeah. And, and, and this is how you do it. And if you hit these marks, you know. You, I guess to be fair, on the contrary, you could also have really good defensive strategy guides sure, right, that yeah. like capture yeah. a lot of that stuff. But yeah, yeah. no, I, I agree. I also think uh, the, there's been a lot of talk in Stormgate about like 3v3 or other like team game modes being like kind of a point of focus. Um, it seems like that is a significant turnoff for some people with RTS where it's a lot of pressure um, for a new player to oh, yeah, put yeah, on themselves yeah. to compete in a 1v1 environment. Yeah, I'm all for that. You know, um, I don't know how much I'll play it. I mean, I guess we'll see. But it, that's not what's really important. Yeah. Like, I want to have my 1v1 experience. I did play competitive 2v2 in StarCraft 1. Um, that's actually a lot of fun. I really wish Blizzard, Microsoft would fix Blizzard and, and, and send someone in to make a ladder for that. But uh, yeah, I mean, anything to welcome new players. I know when I talk to um, the, the people at Blizzard and you know now those people are at Stormgate is that you basically have to have a campaign yeah. because that's just how people will pick the game up. Yeah, Like almost everybody We'll play the campaign. Apparently, except for me and our and Dan and our Tosis. I haven't beat the campaign. I never beat the campaign. Yeah, I don't. I'm, I don't hours. know how that that ends. I don't know if I'll ever do it. It's it's not. I feel like if I play an RTS campaign, it's almost like it's putting me to sleep a little bit. Like it's just it's not what I'm looking for. So, yeah, anything to get new people on board is is welcome. It can feel tedious, like when, when, especially in some of the earlier campaign things where it's like just teaching you to. Do really simple stuff. Yeah, I agree that it, it feels. I just want to also play. a lot of these campaigns teach you the game incorrectly. Yeah. So you're learning. You know, you'll have like five mineral patches or something. And, yeah. Um, yeah, I know. There's just it's it, it, if there's a way that they can have it just remotely look like visible. That. I don't know why you couldn't have a campaign mission that you start out with. You know, four workers and, and, and like you would in like, like using Starcraft or Master as example. And the mineral patches, and the enemy is also going to be building a base on their side of the map, and they're going to scout you with a probe. What they did is they just laid out all the buildings and all this stuff preset, and you're supposed to kind of, like you're in the jungle with a machete, kind of like slash your way through it. And, and it's not wrong, but yeah, it doesn't teach people multiplayer. Yeah, no, it's good. especially also like having uh, campaign specific units. That's another kind of weird thing um, where yeah. it doesn't translate over to the actual game. But it's interesting, I guess. But whatever. Yeah. And it's fun. It's yeah. fun. You know. I mean, that's how I started too. I guess I played through the campaign. I was super into it. It took me weeks and weeks to beat the StarCraft One campaign, and there was times I had to stop and give up and then come back. And I'm like, wow, okay, I finally did it. You know. I remember Sean in some videos talking about like the Prima guides and, and stuff like that. Yeah, like yeah, how yeah, to yeah, beat yeah. the missions. Yeah, that's that's a really funny concept. <laughs> yeah. To have like physical media on how to beat a game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Paying like 25 bucks for a book that tells you to do it. Yeah. And usually it was bad advice too. Yeah, it was yeah. very weird. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I guess who's even writing those things, right? Mm -hmm. Like, um, But, uh, so, you know, when, when, when it comes to your history as, as a competitor, like, is that something you, you, you know, like, miss? Like, do you really miss competing at like a high level, you know, in general? Yeah, uh, yes and no. Um, I mean, the reality is I'm, I'm, you know, I stream on Twitch and I'm laddering and I mean, I'm playing against really good Koreans. Starcraft Remastered Ladder is about as hardcore as you could possibly ask for. Um, and I'm enjoying the, the process of self-improvement. Uh, I did get to go to an ACS qualifier. This was pre-pandemic and compete. I played against Sky, I think it was Bishop. He was like rank six in the ladder. He totally murdered me. Um, but I don't think there's anything that's really stopping me from doing that again, other than that I cast for a living. But, you know, laddering is a form of competing. Um, I think it'd be fun to compete a little bit in these new games that come out as well. Um, but, you know, when I was younger, I would go to these tournaments and there was so much anxiety and emotion 
because I had no clue that I was going to be able to just stay in this space forever. You know, I'm like a freshman in college. Uh, you know, everybody was still saying StarCraft was dead or going to die back then because that's the way the scene is, apparently. Yeah. Uh, it's just full of pessimism. But, yeah, I was like, oh, God, I hope I can win this WCG. I hope I can, you know, make it. And, and I, you know, if I lost too early or even if I lost that, I would cry. I would be so upset. Um, now I just enjoy it. Yeah. You know, the StarCraft one's a quarter of a century old. StarCraft II is doing fine, uh, even without Blizzard. It would be nice if Microsoft came back in here and supported it properly. Yeah. I do see a couple people online being like, no, it's fine. I'm like, no, it's not fine. Yeah. It's, it's, but I mean, hey, it's great. We have the, the Patreon being supported at GSL. It's great that um, ESL you know, has been supported. We, we have StarCraft II. It, we just had that in, in Riyadh for Gamers 8. Uh, Esports World Cup's been announced. So uh, there is still support there. Sure. But yeah, I don't have the same kind of trepidation and anxiety that I had when I was involved before. Now I'm more hopeful. I'm more excited. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I would always love to compete. And, and I think I could enjoy it more now. Yeah, yeah. I think that pessimism for for many years, and obviously for me, it's more so with Starcraft 2, but even prior to that, is this concept of like, oh, it's almost over. It's almost over. Like, the yeah. community's almost over. Like, And that's been the sentiment for so long. People are acting like we're edging death. Yeah. Every, like, this is not healthy. Yeah. It's actually, it's actually a sickness. Yeah. I've thought about this and like, you know, I mean, obviously I love the viewers and I, I make this content for them, but sometimes I, I'm genuinely frustrated. Like, you know, when Diablo Immortal was um, announced, their community humiliated them. Yeah. They said, is it even the guy in the red shirt? He goes, is this Don't a joke? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. The, yeah, but the guy said, you know, is this some kind of an April Fool's joke? He yeah. said, and you could see... Uh, and I felt bad for the guys on stage. You know, I'm not I'm not into like accosting people and no. humiliating people. But um, you know, I thought, why don't we have people doing that with Blizzard? Yeah. Like I, I mean, I can't do it. I'm kind of working on these. But why are you guys not demanding more? I mean, if anything, Blizzard's shown us is that they respond to uh, pressure <laughs> from this. Um, and I mean, I hope Blizzard does come back with Microsoft acquiring them. And, and do stuff uh, with the game and continue to support it, yeah. as as well as the support from the community. I think support from a lot of different directions is essential here, not yeah. one or the other. Um, but yeah, I mean, I just I look at a, a scene that so often is moping uh, about how it's not going to get better. I go, well, may, maybe you know, if you, if it stays like that one day, it won't be. Yeah. You know, if nobody's going to be around to support it. But why don't we try to get into a problem solving mode? Um, this kind of goes back to us talking about, you know, esports making money yeah. and actually figure this thing out instead of just, I don't know what this is, this weird negativity. Yeah. Uh, when in spite of everything, StarCraft 1 and StarCraft 2 are still here. Yeah. If you look at all the games that have, have actually died and the servers have been shut down and, you know, nobody plays it anymore. I mean, it's astounding what it's done. So, you know, of the titles that you've casted, like, outside of the StarCraft world, are there, are there any games that you've, like, become really invested in as a result of, like, you know, working on them? Oh, yeah, there's been a couple. Um, you know, I was really into Street Fighter Four when that came out. I did some work with uh, Mike Ross and Gutex uh, for a network called ESGN that's not around anymore. Uh, Dan did World of Tanks, which is kind of a funny... We got this crazy offer um, to do it. We didn't know much about the game. Uh, it's not exactly a hardcore esport, but we thought this would be kind of funny and fun. It was an Africa product as well, right? Uh, that was a freak of TV, yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, it was like, okay, well, this is kind of a funny opportunity. I would, I would say I was as, as invested in that, but it was something I did for a little bit. Um, what else? I've done a little bit of Valorant the last couple of years. I've actually always done a couple of other games. This is generally, unless your game is giving you endless work, there's just other work you can do with other games. Yeah. Some games, I guess, are more serious than others. Um, and, you know, some of these companies, they just want you to have fun. It's a simple, you know, advertising mechanism. Just go there, you know, do whatever. Try to enjoy the game. Play it a little bit. See what you think. And others are, are more hardcore. Uh, so I've gotten a lot of other work. I did some work for, um, you know, Amaranth. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Only fans, yeah. 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 So she hired Artosis and me to cast um, an event where it's OnlyFans girls and uh, Twitch streamers competing at a water park. Huh. So that was cool. Competing at what? At, 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 like different competitions at a water park. Okay. It's on YouTube. You can look it up. I will. Um, so, I, I mean, I've had opportunities like that. That's um, pretty funny. 
Yeah, yeah. I just did a commercial for LG that was fun. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I'm trying to expand my horizon and, and see what other stuff I can do. So, yeah. Makes a lot of sense. That, yeah, that's... Uh... Yeah, I, I didn't really necessarily think about that, but yeah, it seems like there was always something else uh, for you and, and a lot of times for Dan as well, right? Like over the years, mm -hmm. yeah. Dan did a bunch of stuff with Hearthstone. Yeah. I did a little bit, but he was always, you know, uh, more into Hearthstone. And um, yeah, I mean, there's always been, you know, opportunities out there. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's hard to say no to work, right? Like Sure, yeah. 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 Um, so, <clears throat> kind of closing question, like... Is there any advice that you feel like would be really helpful to somebody that is like looking to enter into the esports industry in today's day and age? Yeah, I think it's important to start working on your own projects. Um, what I did, I think, won't be replicated because I was following a cable TV model. So, I mean, I grew up like watching MTV and I don't, Nickelodeon, all these, all these like all these cable shows, and so then I was watching Korean cable TV. So when I got out here. I was also working for a network that was on cable and then trying to just go to these TV producers and basically drink with as many people involved in esports as possible to, to get me on TV. Yeah. Now that turned out that was, it ended up being the, one of the first streamed shows on the internet, which is the, the GSL at GOM TV. Um, but you don't need to do that anymore. Now Twitch exists and YouTube exists. Make your own content. Um, try to cultivate your own audience. There's a big issue a lot of people have is they try to capitulate to their viewers where I think you can build an audience and teach them what you're trying to, to uh, make and, and you'll find people that enjoy your stuff and don't be too deterred by feedback because there are trolls and, and all that on the internet. That doesn't mean don't take criticism, but um, I would say start making your own stuff. See if you start to get picked up by bigger things and always maintain your own platform. Um, I mean, I've been doing this more and more where I'm streaming. and I'm lucky because I can turn my stream on and I get people that show up immediately. Um, but a lot of people don't, but if you can build your own platform on social media, um, and also not, don't use social media to express every one of your opinions. That's, it's really an advertising tool. Um, you're not going to change the world by virtue signaling on social media, uh, yeah. but build out your social media, build out your Twitch stream or your YouTube, make content there because you're not, you, you can't like, I've had major highs and major lows depending on like, okay, is Guam TV going to be around or is, is Blizzard going to be supporting esports? But when you can build that out and then work on other things that are kind of like what I'm doing, I'm kind of almost going in reverse. Does that make sense? Yeah, starting with the big stuff and then moving to your yeah, own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, so, um, you know, I just do that big event at Gamers 8, but then I come right back home and stream and, and, and try to make content for my YouTube. And so try to build that out as much as possible. Uh, don't burn bridges. Um, doesn't mean don't stick up for yourself, but don't burn bridges. And, um, if you're early on in, in making content or doing like casting work, like I'm doing, you're better off getting friends to give you feedback than going through a comment section. Um, because at least, you know, you, you don't know who's writing that. Yeah. They might be right. They might be wrong, but like opposite it's, opinions. It's, like yeah. Yeah. You'll see completely opposite things said. Yeah. You know, uh, I know for Dan and me, it was like some people thought, you know, this is great. They're being funny. Other people thought like this is disrespectful. Yeah. They're they're messing around. Yeah. Um, it's like it's a video game tournament. Like <laughs> it's a computer game tournament, man. Yeah. You know, it's and also we're people that played computer game yeah. games uh, at, at tournaments growing up. It's not like you know we're yeah uh, you know above this yeah. or something. Yeah. Um. So yeah, something like that. No, no, yeah, that, 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 yeah, it makes quite a lot. Yeah, for me, it's like uh, funny. Like, I do run into that quite a bit, like, uh, with some of this interview content where some people are like, you need to stop talking, like, just, just, just ask questions and, and get feedback. Or, and then other people are like, damn, this guy, he doesn't have an interview. He doesn't, he doesn't give any feedback. It's yeah, like, yeah, it's, 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 there's nothing, <laughs> there's nothing you can do. Yeah. Like, I've, I've had it where I'm, I, I'm doing play by play. And, you know, there was periods I probably shouted too much, you know, and I'm like trying to find my, I'm trying to figure it out. I'm still trying to figure it out. But then people are like, yo, yo, he's, he's, he, this guy's so fake. He's, he's just trying to hype everything. And then like, I tone it down. People are like, he's not hype anymore. And you go, okay, this, you know, uh, it's, it's also it's, seeing the Koreans too, right? Where it's like this sort of culture of extreme hype all the time. Too. Yeah. I think yeah. being influenced by that. It's, so I, was, I was talking to JYP about this in an interview, like, uh, where he was saying that he feels it's Casper Park that sort of like set that energy or, or you know, things yeah. of that nature. When I first moved out here, um, and I was doing solo casting for GOM TV, like nobody really spoke English at the company. So I just screamed a lot when I was casting because I was like, okay, well, at least they're going to, at least they'll know I've got that down. Yeah, and yeah. I was like, I was blowing my voice out every week. I sounded like shit. Yeah. If you look at my old cast, because I had no vocal control, 
Uh, I think that's why a lot of people talked about me smoking or whatever on early form. Just, no, I'm just blowing my, my vocals out. Yeah. I didn't know how to use my diaphragm. I didn't know how to project. It's like if you go to a concert and you just yell. Yeah, you're just shouting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Next just, day you're messed yeah, up. Yeah. You do that a couple days a week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're going to have some problems. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, that's about what I had prepared for you. Uh, any uh, closing words? No, thank you for interviewing me. I really appreciate it. I wish, um, you know... I'm glad you're asking questions about the history of the game and all that. I feel like a lot of times that goes like unexplored. Uh, thank you for taking the time to come out here and, and do this. I'm sorry I got the day wrong. I told you <laughs> Friday, but I was wrong. I thought my mom came in Friday. She came in Saturday. So thank you for rebooking. I, I appreciate it. And um, yeah, I don't know. I guess that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, man. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, yeah. I very much appreciate it. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this one, be sure to leave a like. If you really enjoyed it, consider sharing it with some friends. And if you absolutely love what I'm doing here, be sure to pop over to my Patreon. The link is in the video description down below. You can get access to the videos early there, uh, add free releases of the videos, and you can propel me to continue doing more cool stuff like this. Well, until next time, friends.